in all probability, more people will join us as we get going, but we are delighted to have you here with us uh, today. Um, what, within the past month or so, a small group of us from the Urban Mission Committee had a tour of the warehouse that Melody led, and it was extraordinary, just extraordinary. And you are in for a treat to have this virtual tour uh, this virtual tour this evening. Uh, so I wanted to say how delighted I am to introduce Melody Phillips, who's the Director of Operations for the warehouse. Um, I'd heard it referred to as the teen warehouse. Now I hear it's the warehouse uh, for teens and by teens. And that was one of the amazing things that we learned when we went through the, uh, the, the tour that we had. Melody um, is co-founder of a group called I'm My Sister's Keeper, which is a vibrant organization in the area um, devoted to the development of girls and women and uh, has done some amazing things in that regard. And she is the 2021 recipient of the Delaware State Bar Association's Liberty Bell Award that was recently granted. Um, awarded to an individual who's not a judge or a lawyer, but who's rendered outstanding service to her community. And that award is designed to promote a better understanding of government, a greater respect for the rule of law, and a deeper sense of individual responsibility, which contribute to the effective functioning of governmental institutions. And clearly, Melody's passion for the youth in the community as part of the whole Reach Riverside project and specifically the teen warehouse is really notable. So we all are in for a lovely evening to learn about, um, I, I, I guess I just have to say, I, everything about Reach Riverside and the warehouse, I am so struck by how thoughtful and comprehensive and engaging and wise um, and thoughtful and caring all of the decision-making is. And I know Melody plays a huge role in bringing that to reality every day. So uh, I'm gonna ask you all to mute your microphones and perhaps you wanna put um, your screens on speaker view and we'll turn it over to Melody. Oh, well, thank you so much for that absolutely wonderful introduction. Pleasure to be with all of you this evening. Um, you will definitely see the passion come out in my smile and my voice. I love what I do and I absolutely love interacting with young people. Um, it is my true passion and purpose to ensure that they have all of the resources that I did not necessarily have growing up. As I was sharing with some when we were just having an informal discussion, my grandmother raised me because unfortunately the crack epidemic hit the African American community um, and neighborhoods and, and, and environments really hard in the 80s and 90s. And so my mother ended up being addicted um, really badly and had really um, strong substance abuse issues. And so as many of you may know, um, the crack epidemic was treated like a criminal justice issue and not a mental health issue. And so my mother ended up doing 15 years in prison. So um, I did not see my mother from 1995 until 2015. That was a span of 20 years. Um, and then she was released uh, from prison. And um, she and I are um, thick as thieves today. So we built our relationship uh, from prison. Uh, the melody that you see today had to put in a lot of work to be bubbly and happy. Um, I do a presentation for my teens, it's called Grit. And I show my pictures from when I was in sixth grade. And in those sixth grade pictures, I am not smiling. I am away from everyone else in my class. I am always isolated um, because I used to always say that um, you don't understand where I come from or my neighborhood or how I had to grow up. So because I didn't have all of those resources, eventually my sixth grade teacher came along and she became my mentor. And she really instilled in me a value for life and learning. And um, because me and my grandmother love her to death, love her, love her, but she ruled with an iron fist and she did not play and we had to be in by the street lights came on and everything. And so with that being said, my uh, mentor gave me an outlet from some of those strict rules and really kind of taught me, um, you know, how to embrace education 
and taught me about other cultures and ethics. Um, so much so that when I was young and I was uh, 13 years old, I had no idea that Hocassin, Delaware was in Delaware. I thought Hocassin was in a completely different state because she took me to this really nice neighborhood and I was living in a really poor area. And I was like, oh, what state are we in? And she was like, this is Delaware. <laughs> so um, with that being said, um, my uh, attitude and outlook changed. And then of course, I just really began thinking about how can I make an impact on young people who grew up like me along the way. And so I became a strong youth advocate. And so I always like to refer to myself as an advocate, no matter what title I hold at any um, organization I work for, my job is to advocate on behalf of young people. So with that being said, I am going to go into my PowerPoint presentation and I'll share my screen. And so I can talk to you about the warehouse. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay. All right. So this first picture is um, myself and some of our young people. Um, these are some of the founding members of the warehouse and we are standing in the parking lot and this was in the summer of 2019. As you can see, we all have masks on um, and we just wanted to take a cool picture. We were celebrating um, the young boy up at the front with the braids in his hair. He was graduating from high school that year from Howard High School of Technology. So the warehouse is for teens by teens. And um, every uh, Wednesday, we have this thing called Warehouse Wednesday where we do an open house and information session um, for anyone who is interested in learning about um, the warehouse and how their team can get involved, how you can become involved as a community member and as a parent. And when you come into the warehouse, you receive a very similar PowerPoint presentation, um, but you get to meet our team. And of course, you all can meet this team um, in their names virtually. So <clears throat> I am the director of operations there, Brian Aileen, who is the head of safety and assistant operations manager. We have a program manager and she's in charge of the programming department. So she sees all, oversees all programmatic efforts. Neonta Kelly is our program impact specialist. We call her Mama Neonta because she is all things teens and um, she works directly with the teens on the ground. Jenny Vizi um, assists me and Brian in the operations department. And then we have a safety team, which includes uh, Brandon Wallace and Ronique Haney. And then finally, it rounds it out with Kenneth Harris. Um, he's a new employee. He um, is also reports to Sierra Harris in our program department, and he is our internal youth development facilitator. And the reason that's important is because I do not do this work without any of them. Um, they are an intricate part of the team and everything I do um, is because they're doing a lot of the groundwork. So I, while I may do some high level, some day-to-day -day operations and grant funding, they are the, um, you know, behind the scenes in the brains, making sure that our teens have everything they need to be successful. And then more importantly than our adult staff members are our teen executive board. So the warehouse has a really unique concept. Our teens lead everything programmatic in the facility. So a lot of times when teenagers go to community centers, they will ask if there are certain programs that that community center has. And sometimes, you know, it's not the community center's fault based on funding or what's available. The community center will inform them what's available and what they don't have available. And if a teen says, oh, can you bring this program or that program? A good majority of the time, those traditional community centers are unable to do so because they have certain metrics and goals that they have to meet based on the funding sources that they have coming into the facility. That is the complete opposite at the warehouse. So the warehouse is a convener of partnerships and this teen executive board, um, which includes Anaya Patterson, Jameer Hargraves, Zora Rothwell, Ariane Driver, Tyler Davis and Maris Johnson, are the teens who receive and um, provide information to program partners about how they can facilitate programming in the building. What that means is that program partners who are interested in facilitating programming within our pillars, um, in which I'll cover our pillars, they have to pitch their concept to our teens. So if they have a dynamic program and they think that young people are really interested in hearing it, they have to meet with the teen executive board the teen executive board listens to that pitch, they take a vote, and then they make a decision on whether or not that program will be um, at the facility. 
We bring the resources to the teens, but we do not make the decisions on programming in the building. And so that was that is what makes the warehouse uh, unique from some of the other community centers in the area. This is our mission. So the mission of the warehouse is to be a convener of stakeholders and partners with the goal of creating a collaborative culture that will help revolutionize teen engagement. So we cannot revolutionize teen engagement and say that we have teen leaders if we don't have teens at the forefront and at the table of everything that we do. So oftentimes you will hear people say, oh yes, I have a seat at the table. So our teens not only have a seat at the leadership table, they are the leaders at that table. And so that is one of the core concepts of what we do. We are on a mission to make sure that they become confident, contributing and courageous young adults and that they in turn give back to their peers um, and those peers become leaders after them. So in addition to our teen executive committee members making decisions about programming in the facility, they also serve as near peer mentors for new teen members who enter the building. They provide full week of orientation. They con conduct what's called cultural constitution and core values class about the warehouse. They facilitate programming. <laughs> they do marketing flyers and distribution. Um, they are truly leading all of the programmatic efforts. It is one of the reasons why even during the pandemic, the warehouse currently has 444 teen members um, which is astounding because we have not fully opened up our doors because of COVID. We just received approval uh, this past Friday from our executive management team to open the warehouse. And we are really, really excited about it. So we're going to begin phasing teens in. On June 15th, we will phase in 25 non-teen employees um, because as a result of the pandemic, we have only been allowing our teen employees to come into the facility, but now we will allow non-teen employees to come in the building. Um, then in July, we'll phase another 25 in, and then in August, we will phase in 50. In September, we will be fully open um, after Labor Day. We are going to have a true grand opening in August, so when all of that marketing material and everything is set up, I will make sure, Ms. Sue, that you get that. Um, because we're going to do what was our original plan in 2020 and have a full week of a grand opening. So the warehouse has five pillars, which is recreation, education, arts, career, and health. And so each day we're going to have a theme. One day will be recreation, education, art, career, and health. Because the warehouse has a significant workforce development program, we're going to have um, that Thursday be the grand opening in the ribbon cutting because that will be the career pillar day. And then of course that'll lead into Friday and then into um, the weekend. We're planning this for either the third or fourth week of August. And so again, as more details come out and we make all of these um, updates and we're really excited about it, we will make sure that um, all of our partners have that information. So within these pillars, the warehouse has more than 150 program partners both small nonprofit organizations and some of your larger organizations that are more familiar like your YMCA's, your YWCA, your Bo um, Boys and Girls Club, your Girls Inc. Um, but we also have a lot of small grassroots nonprofits that have really dynamic programming that the teens have approved, but they just don't have a home to facilitate that programming out of. So the concept in what we do um, in this shared services um, situation with our program partners is that our program partners come in and they facilitate services and programming within one of those pillars. They don't charge our teens to participate in their program and we don't charge them to use the space. So that's how we work out everything with our program partners. Um, and it's a really win-win because our program partners um, have dynamic programming, but they don't necessarily have the teens. So we're able to get the teens to them and then whatever funding, whether it's small or larger they have, they can just use that for the programming and not have to worry about renting and leasing and that sort of thing. So you may have heard me mention several times for teens by teens, which is our model. And it means exactly that. Our model empowers teens to make decisions on events, partnerships, programming, and much more. Teens lead and adults guide. So these are a few of our teens who were participating in our school supply giveaway um, last uh, summer. 
And um, to the um, um, young lady standing um, in the middle, her name is Ariane Driver. She is a founding member of the warehouse. She is also a former resident of Riverside in Wilmington. And so the warehouse is um, a direct service entity um, as a part of what's called the work group. So it's the warehouse, Reach Riverside and Kingswood Community Center. So um, our CEO, Logan Herring, loves a good acronym. So it's called WRK, W for Warehouse, R for Reach Riverside, K uh, for Kingswood Community Center. The reason I'm pointing out Ariane specifically is because um, in, in, in addition to the warehouse, the um, housing projects that are currently owned um, by Wilmington Housing Authority are um, being replaced placed by new mixed income housing units um, in the heart of the Riverside community, which is on the Northeast corridor of Wilmington. And so Arion grew up in one of those housing projects and is, has been really successful with being a founding member of the warehouse, has another job and has been instrumental with making sure that other teams specifically from Riverside know about the warehouse, know about the services and are able to come in. In fact, today when I had a staff meeting, we decided that the first 25 teens were going to phase in at housing projects. Um, Arion is off to college this year, and she will be going to Delaware State University, um, and uh, she's really excited about that. The other young lady who is sitting down, her name is Zora Rothwell. She is the vice chair of the teen executive committee. Um, Zora is instrumental with making sure that teen members are signed up for membership at the warehouse. She is in charge of our rec desk database membership application system. And so she is intricate in making sure that teens understand the membership process. Zora will be going to Clark Atlanta University this year. And then finally, the young man over there, his name is Jameer Hargraves. And as I mentioned during the tour to some of you who visited, Jameer is what we call our million dollar man. Jameer has, um, <laughs> has a, a, attained more than $1.25 million in scholarships for college. Many of them were institutional scholarships. However, um, as a result of his efforts to um, secure external scholarships not tied to a specific institution, he has now been able to secure scholarships that will pay for both his first and second year at Howard University. And he will, um, his goal is to walk away debt free. He will be a business major, um, business pre-law major. Jameer has applied for 24 um, colleges and he is 23 for 24. The only college that he was not accepted into is Harvard University. And so um, with that being said, he did get through the interview process. Um, and so we had a deal. If he did not get into Harvard, we go back to Ivy League for law school. So I just really, really love sharing information about our young people um, because there's always, you know, a lot of gun violence that happens in Wilmington. And a lot of times our young people are involved in that. And we always want to shine a light on the positive efforts that they're making in their communities. Uh oh, let's see what happened there. There we go. The warehouse has a food pantry and it's called Plenty. Nice play on words, plenty in the house for everyone. And so our food pantry is open Tuesday through Thursday from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. It is managed by one of our adult staff members, Brandon Wallace, and three teen employees. Anyone from the community, no matter what part of the community that you are in, can come to Plenty during the hours and um, we provide them with the menu. They pick whatever they like off of the menu and Brandon and his team members box it up for them and take it out to their car. So everything that we do is in true service to the community. And our goal is to make sure that our teams have an, a true understanding of community service. It's also embedded into their leadership development and workforce development program. So if you're a teen employee, you go through 90 days of leadership development and employability skills training. You get everything from conflict resolution to problem solving skills to time management and financial literacy. And a part of that, you are partnered with an organization called Multiplying Good. And Multiplying Good helps each cohort create their own community service learning project because we want our teens to understand that giving back to the communities that they actively engage in is an intricate part of professionalism. It is what we do to make sure that the 
people coming behind us and others in society um, are aware of our efforts and that we are there to help serve and provide them with the resources that they need. All right, so how do you become a member of the warehouse? So for all of you who are grandparents and have grand teens who um, would like to be a member of the warehouse or their teens have friends, um, membership is completely free at the warehouse. Our age range is 13 to 19 years old. And um, if you're in the age range of 14 and 19, you can apply for one of the positions that we have. 13, you can't work yet. It's against Department of Labor rules, but you can participate in a lot of our activities. So we use a database membership application system called RecDesk. And RecDesk is how our teens sign up for membership. So when a teen goes to what's called the warehouse.recdesk.com, they create their own username and profile. They fill out their membership application. And from there, they can register for all different programs that are going on in the facility. So if they're interested in playing basketball, they can register for that. If they want to do art and painting, they can do that. If they want to play basketball, they can do that. And again, if they're in the age range to be able to work, then they can also apply for a position that's available at the warehouse. And that's the link for how our teens, and I'll make sure, uh, Sue has this um, information too. So if anyone needs it, we can make sure that you receive it. And that's pretty much the warehouse. Any questions? <laughs> and I'll stop sharing. Well, that, that was wonderful. I, I wanna come see it. <laughs> You definitely can. We do tours all the time. So you're more than welcome to come. All of you are. We would be happy to have you. Yeah. And it sounds like the August opening is going to be a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing in the community. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bring my people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are definitely really excited about oh, I'm sorry, Miss Sue. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying we're really excited about the opening. <laughs> Uh, delayed by about a year and a half, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Built up enthusiasm. Yes, it has definitely built up. Um, well, the running joke around the warehouse is that we were under renovations in 2019. We moved in in March of 2020 and we moved out. <laughs> <That was COVID. laughs> uh, those of us who took the tour, um, I'm trying to think, Casey Morrison, uh, Jim and Polly Paul, Paul Carter, and I and Mike, were you part? I'm trying to remember. Were you part of the? Uh, there, I couldn't was make fifth, it. there was a fifth person. Anyway, uh, to go through the space is extraordinary. It is so bright and so vibrant. Um, and when we were met at the door, Charlie McDowell, you may know, is the chair of the board of Reach Riverside and passionately devoted to this. Charlie is a member at Westminster. And um, when we walked in the front door, there's a, there's a section right there and it's a, there's a counter and there's some shelving. And uh, apparently it is designed to be part of the welcoming area. And I think we understood that the teens would potentially be selling t-shirts and other products and things that they had developed. And, um, it's for teens by teens, so they got to name it. And they yep. named, and the, and the name was there on the window. And it's called The Drip. The Drip. <laughs> and we yes. said, The Drip? What does, what does that mean? And the response was, the teens are in charge. They got to name it. They named it The Drip. It's called The Drip. And so, <laughs> that's it. It's The Drip. Um, we walked in a little bit further, and on the left is a doorway, and it says the Lisa Blunt Rochester Dance Studio, mm -hmm. because Lisa Blunt Rochester has been a strong supporter of this entire project, and we learned that at some point in her life, maybe now still, don't necessarily see this, uh, was a ballerina, and oh, so really? the dance yeah. studio is, is named for her. And then we walked down a little further to the arts room 
And on the wall is painted this amazing mural that has uh, Martin Luther King depicted. And the young female artist who painted that also was involved after the demonstrations and the issues in Wilmington after George Floyd was killed when windows were broken and, and uh, plywood was put up to cover them. And she painted murals on the plywood in Wilmington um, as part of the recovery after the response to, to George Floyd's death. And just outside of there is a meditation circle that the teens decided was an important part of their time together. And down a little ways is this incredible kitchen. Um, <laughs> And Melody Ms. shared Joe, I can that, show the uh, video if you want. Her soul food programs in the kitchen there. Anyway, it just you you get so swept up in the spirit and the energy and the and it's in the midst of you know a really poor section of Wilmington and it is a a personification of hope um, and joy. For kids, um, and you know, when we when we introduced the announcement for tonight's program, we referenced the article that was in the News Journal on May twentieth that focused on the continuing gun violence in Wilmington and made an urgent case for more meaningful, effective youth programs in the city. And I can't think of any place more uh, in tune with what's needed to help our city's youth become um, contributing, meaningful, effective parts of the community. It's just, it's extraordinary. It's just extraordinary. I, I encourage you to visit. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is the, I guess it's hydroponic. Uh, oh, farm. yes, I was gonna say to you. Do you wanna say, wanna you say something about show? that, Melody? Oh, sure. it, yep. And our electric bus. Um, if you want, I can show them the impact video. Yeah. Oh yeah, so we did a 2020 impact video that showed all of the efforts between the Warehouse Kingswood Community Center and Reach. So I'll pull that up. That would be great. This Front Verbo is about to become part of an unforgettable right, vacation. That commercial. The, moment the work group, the volunteers. The Wait, I want to make sure you guys can hear that. Uh, hold on. Make sure you have sound. All right. Go back. The supporters, the donors, the community residents are working to deal in one of the most challenging times in our country. If we're ever going to make a real difference in how we address racial inequalities in the United States, reach Riverside, the work around Riverside is some of the most important in our whole country. The organization has credibility citywide. It's got credibility among foundations and corporations and governments. We just have a strong sense that this is going to be a successful endeavor. Children and sort of teens and young adults of color are not getting a fair shot in our county, in our city, in our state, in our, in our country. And this is an institution where we work to, to make society a little more equal. These are our children, right? These are the children that we see in our hospital. These are the children in our community. These are our children and we must do more. If we can make a lasting difference in Riverside, we can show that we can actually make a lasting difference in intergenerational poverty um, that is highly correlated with race. We're in a pandemic. We also have faced a racial reckoning. And so to see this community, to see Reach Riverside come together and say, we're not gonna just lament and feel bad about the situation. We're gonna go into action from their health to their education to the development of this area and building wealth and home ownership. It is a past, present, and future that will create a legacy for all of us.
I'm Logan Herring, a CEO of the Warehouse Reach Riverside and Kingswood Community Center, what we affectionately call ourselves the work group. The impact of our work in 2020 has been tremendous. We distributed over $280,000 collectively to all of the families in the public housing community of, of Riverside. We distribute 342 Chromebooks, over 10,000 meals, providing household supplies, assisting folks get signed up for the census. Our team, our staff, our board members, our volunteers, our partners, everybody really stepped up to the call. We had to adjust uh, our delivery throughout the year. Uh, certainly wanted to still have an impact even in face of COVID. So we were finding different ways to be able to continue to have an impact of our community, even though the center wasn't physically open. It's just so amazing because there's something about empowering and uplifting a community through food. I think we're gonna start a movement of people taking back their power to grow and really cultivate their bodies in a different way. My team has gone beyond what I expected. I try to get them to focus on where we are at this moment and the things that we could do to help the children become the great people we know they can. We are gonna create a, a cradle to college education system to serve the kids, plus all the health and wellness facilities that are necessary to, to make for a robust neighborhood. Taking people out of an impoverished situation and moving them into a thriving mixed income environment, you say, I mean, that's a no brainer. We know concentrated poverty does not work. Historically, that is what public housing has done. What we're doing here is, it's, it's a microcosm of, you know, what we're trying to fix in the nation as a whole. Teen Warehouse is a place of refuge for all of our children. When you have the president-elect of the United States come visit the Teen Warehouse, that matters. That tells our children that you are the most important individuals in the nation. And that's the message that we need to be sending to our babies. My passion is to give back to them so they can have more than what I had and they can see, wow, Miss Melody, you grew up in South Bridge, you have a master's degree, how did you do this? Because I want them to know that they can do it too. So you name it, we did it. Virtual programming, access to health care, access to resources, access to basic needs. That's what we did, and that's what we're continuing to do. The mission at Reach Riverside is to eliminate the barriers of structural racism, identifying what the oppression and those barriers have been over time, and systematically break them down, and at the same time, build our community up. And that's what we're doing with the work group, the Warehouse Reach Riverside and Kingswood Community Center. So that's why I do what I do. <laughs> Great stuff. Hey, Melody, I have a question. I'm just curious as far as the uh, neighborhood reach, meaning um, how you are attracting, uh, you know, these teenagers and how far are you accessing them from within the city limits or outside the city limits? Oh, that's a really great question. So, oh, wait a minute, sorry, thought I ended that. <laughs> sorry about that. So that's a really great question. Um, so our teens are our biggest marketing push um, because um, as all of you know, by being parents and grandparents, if you say something to your child five times and then their peer says something once in the exact same way you said it, they're gonna go with what their peer said um, more likely, and then you'll look and you'll say, but I, I said it first, like I, I, I said that five times. And they're like, no, but, but Jessica said it. No, but, but mom was first, I said it first. So we use that to our advantage in this situation. And so what happens is um, while the warehouse is uh, strategically placed in um, the Riverside corridor of Northeast Wilmington, and we do have a heavy focus to recruit teens directly from the housing projects, we service teens throughout the entire Newcastle County. So when we look at our percentages, um, about 36% of the teens come from the 19802 zip code, which is a combination of Northeast and Riverside community. And then the rest come from East Side, South Ridge and the West Side community. Um, we also have teens that come from the Newark, Bear, and Newcastle area as well, probably about 12% of them because transportation is usually a barrier for them to come. 
during the pandemic, we launched something called the Wave, which is the Warehouse Advanced Virtual Experience. So of course, when you're on Zoom, you can come from anywhere. So we had teams from that participated from Dover, uh, Sussex County. We also had teams participate from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, um, as well as North Carolina. They would log on and participate in our activities. Um, because a lot of our teens have family members that live in other states. And so when it was virtual, they were like, you're not doing, you're sitting in the house like I'm sitting in the house, get on Zoom and paint with me or, <laughs> or jump on Zoom and dance with me because I'm bored in this house and you're bored at your house in another state. So that was really um, impactful. But yes, um, most of our teens uh, do come directly from within the city of Wilmington limits which actually ties in, Michael, to Sue's point earlier in regard to some partnerships we have with Delmarva, one being an electric bus. So we just received a 56 passenger electric bus um, about a month ago. We're in the, we um, have it registered and it has insurance and all of that on it now. Um, and so the goal of that electric bus is to create transportation loops within the city. I will have my first transportation convening meet, meeting with other brick and mortar community centers throughout the city of Wilmington to create transportation stops in front of each community center. So there would be in the city of Wilmington on the north side of town, there'll be a stop in front of the warehouse, Brown Boys and Girls Club, Reed's Refuge Center, and the PAL. And then on the west side of town, there would be a stop at um, different community centers there. So William Hicks Anderson, uh, Hilltop, um, um, Hilltop uh, West End Neighborhood House, as well as the Latin American Community Center and Frame Boys and Girls Club, as well as the Youth Empowerment Center. The concept of this is to ensure that we share services across all of these organizations and so we're not competing. And it allows our teens to get safely to and from different organizations and get back to their home center safely. So if their home community center is the warehouse and they would like to go swimming at Brown Boys and Girls Club because we don't have a swimming pool at, um, at the warehouse, we can get them there. They can participate in swimming. Brown Boys and Girls Club will honor their warehouse membership and then we get them back safely to the warehouse. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Yep, you're very welcome. And if you need a driver, let me know. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we do, seriously. <laughs> Uh, Mike, well, right, I might have to get information. Yes, let's <laughs> talk. We need one. Yes, badly. <laughs> um, we, we just had a conversation today about um, where are we going to get a bus driver that has the right credentials? We need a driver. And we all just looked at each other like, oh, yeah, it's none of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, Mike, we'll talk. I'm sorry. I think I saw a hand somewhere. I had a question um, uh, with the teen board. Oh, wait. You can hear me? Can you? I had a question about the, how the teen uh, board of directors works and how that interfaces with the adult staff. Like they are, do adult staff members sit in quietly during teen board meetings? Can you say anything? Do you have any? And then, and then when something's decided, who exactly carries it out and to what degree are the teens involved? I get, I'm curious how that all works because I'm sure it works great, but I'm just curious. No, 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 another really great, great question. Um, so yes, the teen executive committee um, of the, so there's two things, the warehouse has an actual a board, which has two co, has co-chairs. So the actual warehouse board, which is adults has um, a co-chair, uh, representative Sherry Dorsey Walker as um, the one co-chair and then Anaya Patterson, the young lady you saw on there, she's 18 years old. She is the other co-chair of the actual warehouse board. Wow. She was voted in as the initial chair last May and um, when she was 17 years old. And then eventually she brought on the adult co-chair of the actual warehouse board and they got voted in. Um, even with them serving as co-chairs, Anaya runs and facilitates all of the board meetings. Um, she does her Robert's Rules of Order. She brings the committee to um, attention. She um, has the information that she needs. And so how that ties into that teen executive committee, when the teen executive committee, they meet once per month and they discuss all of the needs of their peers in the warehouse. Anaya takes that information up to the warehouse um, board if necessary, especially if there's funding involved, and she seeks approval on different activities that our teens would like to do. 
And so we have a very, very good, generous board. So they've never said no to our teams about activities that they've wanted to do. Um, they always, they will come up with a game plan. So what happens during those teen executive committees, I sit in on all of those meetings. I usually am the person who takes their meeting minute notes um, for them. And it gives me an opportunity to learn about what are some of the initiatives they would like to do. And then I always um, challenge them to create a budget and a program development plan for every initiative that they would like to have at the warehouse. So it is their responsibility to bring back to me a budget and a program development plan. Um, it just happened, we're having a huge Juneteenth event, um, which is gonna be Saturday, June 19th to celebrate the emancipation of slavery. And so the teens wanted to have this event and I said, I need a program plan as well as a budget. Um, they submitted to me their program plan. And when I asked where their budget was, they have gotten very unique. They have been able to secure right now their budget on, they only need $250 because they were able to leverage our relationships with another organization called Open Streets, who was already paying for a lot of stuff to close off the street in our area. So they said, well, we should partner on Juneteenth so the warehouse doesn't have to have that much money come out of pocket but still had the warehouse logo on all of the open streets material, as well as the t-shirts. So <laughs> brilliant, really, that's great. Yeah. And so my other question is, is she going to do all that from college next year? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a lot. That's fabulous. So no, she is. Um, so um, um, Anaya is passing the torch. Um, we have a young lady. Her name is Amaris Johnson. She was on my slide. Um, her name was on my slide. Amaris um, was voted onto the teen executive committee in January. Um, and we do succession planning with our teens. So um, I do succession planning with the teens of the teen executive committee. They each have their own documentation on who the next teen is coming after them and who they have selected to take over their role, particularly because of the teen executive committee, there's seven and five of them are leaving to go to college. So we had to come up with a succession plan for them. So Amaris is going to step into Anaya's role and she has been being groomed and planned and this has been planned since January. So she shadows Anaya, she sits in on board meetings so she can have a true understanding of what it's like to be in that role. Jameer Hargraves, um, he has um, partnered with uh, two of our teens, their twins, uh, Cameron and Bryson. They will take over his role as the vice chair. Uh, Zora Rothwell also serves as a current vice chair on the committee. Um, she has partnered with one of our young ladies, Treasure. Treasure will move into her role so that they all have their individual succession plan. So this is where it comes in when teens lead an adult's guide. They didn't know what a succession plan is. So Miss Melody comes in. This is what a succession plan is when you're moving from one phase of your life to another. We create this, we create documents because your next set of teen leaders has to understand the significance of your current roles and how important this teen executive committee is. So we've been working with them since January. We'll have our final succession planning meeting at the end of July, because many of them, of course, as freshmen in college, will be leaving that first or second week of August, but it has been going really well. And then their responsibility after each succession planning meeting is to meet with their mentee to make sure that they have all the requisite information that they need. What amazing life skills they're <laughs> learning. I mean, really. I think, they're, I think that I know there are corporations who could take a page out of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Talk, you know? Yes. One of the our, things our I mentioned. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, one, of the, too. <laughs> one of the things I mentioned was the farm. It's it's like a a, a semi, a truck body. It's I guess a hydroponic farm. Anyway, every month I correct me if I'm wrong, it produces something like an acre or an acre and a half of produce. And 60% of yeah. that produce is made available to a, um, a vegetable stand, a produce stand that moves yeah, throughout the thing. city yeah. to places where there are food deserts and no opportunity to buy fresh produce. And so 60% of the produce is sold that way. And then the other 40% is donated to families who need that kind of support for their diet and nutrition and can't afford it. I mean, I, it, it, it just, and, and there's a refrigerator out front. You wanna talk about the refrigerator, yeah. Melody? 
Yes. So um, thanks, Ms. Sue. So yes, our, um, that the ag pod, um, we actually just um, harvested a small um, collard greens. They went up into our vertical farm trays. So the young lady that you heard on the video say is something about cultivating people will take back their power through food. Her name is Jessica Westcott. She is our farm manager for the ag pod. Um, and so we're getting ready to have this huge energize the warehouse event with Delmarva Power because the electric bus, the agricultural pod and our solar panel on the roof were all donated by uh, Delmarva Power. It is a $1.8 million project. And so, um, yes, Delmarva has been significantly um, involved in every step of the way. And what happens is after that um, produce and you know what the 40% that Ms. Sue mentioned that will be given away, it will go into that community fridge. There are two community refrigerators in the city of Wilmington. One sits directly in front of the warehouse and the other sits in front of our sister organization, Kingswood Community Center. This is an opportunity for anybody in the community, no matter who you are, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can open the refrigerator and take out anything that you would like. We stock it every single week, um, usually twice a week with all sorts of produce. And then um, Jessica Westhot has a really good relationship with the honeybee market in Trolley Square. And um, yes, oh, you know what, Miss Martin, Martin, you know, I see you shaking your head. And so the honeybee market um, donates to both of those refrigerators and they provide all of the frozen food that goes into the, uh, the freezer part. Um, and so it works really well. Um, we also have some private donors who um, support the community refrigerator as well as um, the food pantry. Um, it has been showcased on um, local and uh, um, some of our regional news, ABC, CBS, and uh, Fox News affiliates um, in regards to the community refrigerator. People say, what is the catch? There is no catch. You hand sanitize, you go in, you get it. On our, um, at the Kingswood Community Center, their janitorial staff um, uh, cleans it out every single day. And then they put, um, you know, the produce back in, they wipe it down, especially with germs and COVID, et cetera. And then on our side, our safety ambassador team does the same thing. Um, and then it gets stocked every week. We have, we do a survey out to the community to ask them if there's anything in the fridge that they haven't seen that they would like, and they respond. And then we try to get that and put that in the refrigerator as well. So it's really just extraordinary. Um, uh, East Side Charter School is kind of part of the, the neighborhood, the Reach Riverside area. Uh, you know, Urban Promise School, while not technically part of Reach Riverside, is just across the street on Thatcher Street. So this is an area that Westminster knows well. Um, and our Urban Mission Committee is gearing up for our backpacks project this fall. Um, Marlis, Casey Morrison, Peter Gildner, and I just had a meeting today to plan for the backpacks. And um, Casey, I believe, was in touch with Melody about uh, backpacks for the Teen Warehouse. Um, last year, we had some that we provided to Urban Promise Academy, the high school program there. Uh, and so we're looking for ways to integrate the Teen Warehouse uh, and provide school supplies to the, uh, to, the, to the high school students, the teens there. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're just thrilled to be even a small part of what goes on there and are really hoping that more and more of our members and the people that we know will get engaged uh, in helping the programs. For, when we had our tour, we said, how can we help? And Melody said, well, basically we're not open for much of anything now. <laughs> but you could help us with events. Um, and so part of it is helping at events and attending events like the Juneteenth celebration, like the August grand opening. Uh, it's an opportunity both to learn more and to show support for something that is clearly transformative uh, in deeply meaningful ways to mm -hmm. the youth in our city um, who are in such great need of the kind of role models and the kind of um, education and life skills that the Teen Warehouse is, is focused on providing. So Melanie, Melody, you just do an extraordinary job with your, with your whole team and, and we're deeply grateful for you being here tonight to share it with us. Oh, thank you. Thank, I would say um, 
Uh, two uh, fun facts, Miss uh, Sue. One, we we confirmed our school supply giveaway date. So August twenty okay. eighth is going to be the day. We just confirmed it today during my staff meeting. So August that will 20, be today. August twenty eighth. August twenty eighth. Yep, will okay, be great. the school supply giveaway. Um, and then we'll have a flyer come out and everything. So we'll be coordinating with you offline about that and as well as KC. And then in regards to Urban Promise Academy, um, Makaya Young is a senior at Urban Promise Academy currently, and she has a full four-year ride to Delaware State University for public health. So I thought you would like to know that too. Yes. That's wonderful. Congratulate her for us. That's great. Yes, That's definitely. great. Thank you so much for having me. It has truly been a pleasure. Um, we always say we cannot do the work um, without members of the community, such as ourselves, who are really interested in learning everything um, that we do. Miss Sue, you really, really, you almost made me cry, but you really touched my heart because as, a, as an African-American woman and when um, the incident with George Floyd happened, a lot of people, you know, have will always say riots and you did not use that language and you just, Oh, you just you just touched my heart with that. So thank you for 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 just using a, a different language. I I so appreciate it. You just don't know how you melted my heart with that. <laughs> thank you, Melody. Thank you. Yeah, that vocabulary means a lot in yes. in many regards. Yep. Yes. Yes. Well, well I want to thank you. you all for being here. I want to let you know about our program next week. It's going to be quite extraordinary. Um, you may all have heard the term critical race theory. It has become a huge flashpoint uh, in the country and certainly in the area of education. And so uh, we have a uh, professor from American University, Dr. Janice Yu, who is uh, going to come and we're going to talk about what is critical race theory. Um, the, the title is The Misuse of Critical Race Theory, A Handicap for Truth in Public Education. She is a curriculum specialist. And this is in, in the context of House Bill 198, which has passed both the House and Senate in Delaware to mandate um, black history education be integrated into American history for grades K to 12. Uh, and Senator Laura Sturgeon, a retired teacher and current Delaware State Senator will be part of that program as well to speak about the legislation uh, and its likely impact on students in our state. So it should be a wonderful program. And we hope you, Melody, you are more than welcome to attend uh, as well. We hope to see you all uh, next Thursday. So thank you again. Thank you so great. much, Melody. Thank it was thank great. You. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Good night. Good night.